It's been almost 30 years that I've worked in this domain, almost 30 years in the forests all over the world, and it's an important aspect of my life. I can't imagine doing anything else. I'm cut out to be out in nature, to further science. There's nothing Steve Goodman likes more than to be out in nature in contact with the animals. An internationally renowned researcher, this American biologist landed in Madagascar in 1987. He quickly saw that very few biological inventories had been carried out on the flora and fauna of this island with incredible biodiversity. He decided to take up the challenge and founded the research group Vahatra, which in Malagasy means roots. Here, there are lots of drawings of animals that were discovered by us, like the bat subfossil, the little tenrec, the rodent, and here's a new bird for science. And there are quite a few others here, like the scorpion, another bird subfossil, a fern, etc. In the last 20 years, at least 250 new species have been discovered for science by ourselves or the team working with us. Today, Steve begins a new mission on the ground in an as yet unexplored sector of the Sahafina forest in eastern Madagascar. He hopes to observe the tenrec, a little rodent with an unusual physique resembling that of a hedgehog and that very few researchers have had a chance to study. The fourth largest island in the world, Madagascar is a unique place with more than 15,000 native species, which represents 3% of global biodiversity. One aspect that is very important for biological studies, just as much of Madagascar's biodiversity is unknown, and in order to prioritize and take vital action in the near future, we must know which animals, plants, etc., are living in the same area of forest. After a six-hour drive, Steve Goodman and his team finally arrive at their destination. To accomplish this mission, Steve is surrounded by students, research assistants and researchers specializing in small mammals. Everyone quickly pitches in, setting up the base camp as well as a rudimentary laboratory that the researchers will use for the 10 days of their mission. Despite the sparse comfort of the living arrangements, they are all very glad to finally be out in the field. Already there's the change of scenery. At the office, we have four walls. Here, everything is open plan. That's one thing. And, more especially, Living as a team, we're thinking of the same things, of research, of biodiversity. So we already have this one thing in common, our love and passion for nature. With the meal finished, it's time to prepare the equipment before nightfall. Steve and the team head for the forest to install around 100 traps and nets that will enable them to catch known species, but also, perhaps, new species. While Steve and the students carry on setting up the cages, bat specialist Corey Schumann has found the ideal spot to install his nets. The river is pretty deep and slow moving. It is therefore perfect for capturing the only mammal that is able to fly. One of the reasons why this is a very effective catching technique is because bats use two different echolocation systems. The one they emit sound through the mouth and the other one they emit sound through the nose. 
So the bats that are drinking and emitting sound through the mouth must stop echolocating when they swoop down to drink water. So they don't pick up the net and we can hit them. Each researcher has his own technique. There's the trap, the net, etc. But it's like your own recipe. The methodology on each mission is exactly the same, but that's how we can compare data between sites. Okay. Corey and his assistants just finished setting up the nets when a storm breaks out. Working on in these conditions is impossible. The whole team must return to base camp. Despite the setback, their enthusiasm is unaffected. So glad are the researchers to be back in action. Each mission in Madagascar is like your first mission. There's a certain sense of expectation. What will we find? Is it something unknown? What will we discover? And it's good to be drinking a coffee at 3.30 in the morning, waiting by the camp for the moment that we can go and see what's in the traps. As darkness settles on the camp, the team wonders, will the rain stop during the night? Or will they have to wait for the following night to finally be able to observe the animals? Four thirty in the morning, the rain has finally ceased. A large part of the team heads for the river to check whether bats have been caught in the nets. In the thick of the jungle, the researchers are on the lookout for anything that moves. Cory must quickly free the bats from the nets because of the fragility of their wings. He must act with care to avoid being bitten. I think most of the misconception about these animals is because people never have a chance to really look at them close. You know, once you begin to handle bats, you realize they are actually quite extraordinarily beautiful. Not only are they not rats, because most people think this is just a flying rat. Once you start looking at the incredible diversity and you get close to these animals, those ideas that you have in your mind that was told to you as a child very quickly disappear. On each expedition, the routine is the same. Rise at dawn, harvest the animals before the first heat of the day, and back to camp. Then begins the meticulous observation of animals in the makeshift laboratory. As well as inventorying species native to Madagascar, the goal of field research is to inform the people about the important part that small mammals play in the forest ecosystem. The bat is a fine example. Scutophilus robustus. This is a, a female in very nice condition. You can see she's pregnant. You can see the two embryos on the sides. The well-developed nipples. She has an incredible bite force. She will easily slice through my nail if I give her a chance because she has to crunch the beetles in flight very quickly. This is why they call her robustus. This particular species is, particular, is, is unique to Madagascar. The only mammals that fly and the only animals that are able to rule the night and help us control the pests such as mosquitoes and other horrible flying insects that actually travel as much more than these animals. Achille, meanwhile, is fascinated by reptiles and amphibians. He takes great pleasure in studying these unloved species that are essential to the food chain. They remain in the leaves and emit their calls. 
It's not only the frog that is important, but it is part of the important things that make up the biodiversity, as each plays a part in their ecological niche and each plays a part in the functioning of the ecosystem. The frogs are interesting. They're nocturnal like the bats, and there's such diversity all over the world. It's magnificent. And I think that in Madagascar we find... Lots of species. Lots of species of various colors, various sizes, with various vocalizations. In all, there are 244 named species, but there are still lots awaiting identification. Field research also allows for precious data to be gathered relating to human health. Each year in Madagascar, between 250 and 500 people die of the plague passed on by a small rodent. Ratus ratus, better known as the black rat, was introduced by humans to the island of Madagascar several centuries ago. It's very important to have baseline information about the, the numbers of rats, the presence of the rats, which species of rats, and the work that Steve is doing with colleagues in determining the presence of um, various virus and bacterial agents that are potentially pathogenic to people and even to indigenous animals as well. So by being able to take these samples and analyze the, 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 the viruses, we can get a much better perspective about the potential human health risk and the health to livestock and indigenous animals. From Steve's work over the last 20-something years, his observations seem to show that where rats move into a new area, the, the numbers of indigenous species of tendrix and rodents definitely do decline. On an island like Madagascar, knowledge is vital. There are so many choices which forest is the most important in terms of protection. Without data, it's difficult to prioritize consistently and usefully. In a sense, and this is typical of somewhere like Madagascar, we can't protect the unknown. Protecting Madagascar's biodiversity is no small task, as there are still innumerable species that have not yet been catalogued. With the aid of ultrasound microphones and a tunnel, a kind of trap with closed ends, Cory identifies the various species of bats. Here they are speaking like humans speak. Look, look how complex. So the fly tunnel is a very useful way to ensure that we can build up a call library of all of the species of a particular area so that we can use that library to identify bats without having to catch them even. But with this system, you will not miss anything. Every bat that passes, you will record. Because I work all over um, Africa and Madagascar has a unique bat fauna. So and compared to the rest of Africa, there are bat species here that you can find nowhere else. So it's a very special place to come and do bat work. Despite the darkness, Steve and his students have just spotted a very strange little animal. The greater dwarf lemur, commonly called the mouse lemur. This is a pretty amazing species. During the dry season, when there isn't too much to eat, this is a species of lemur that hibernates. It can remain hidden for two or three or four months when there's nothing to eat. Now we're at the start of the rainy season, so I imagine this mouse lemur has just emerged from hibernation. Steve would love to capture this little lemur and study it better. This mammal, very close to human in its origins, is the perfect example of a species' evolution over time. 
but it remains to be seen whether the little primate will let himself be caught. Finally, Steve has managed to capture a mouse lemur. Weighing barely 60 grams, this mammal is not only the smallest of the lemurs, but also the smallest primate in the world. This is a mouse lemur. Until 1998, there were only two recognized species in Madagascar. And this is a nocturnal, omnivorous animal. But that means he'll eat your fingers. No. Rather, he eats fruit, insects, and things like that. It's a plant pollinator in that it disperses the seeds. It really is a natural element in terms of the functioning of the ecosystem. In a way, you might say that the mouse lemur is a tiny distant cousin of ours. But we really do have roots in common with a creature like this. It's the evolutionary curve of primates. Evolutionary biology is really the stages of evolution, the descendants. For example, there's a river and lots of rain falls in the hinterland and the river divides into two branches and the animals that live on one side, in the middle and on the other side, are no longer in contact with each other. A long time passes and things can change in the way they sing, the way they reproduce, and each family in these three populations for example, 10,000 generations later, can be very different. While they were collecting from the traps, the researchers were thrilled to find this much coveted species, the famous tenrec. Everyone is fascinated by this discovery. Oh, that's fantastic. It's incredible. It's a tenrec hedgehog. You can just see its head here. Behind us, you can hear an Indri crying. There's a group around 250 meters behind us. This is their way of saying hello to one another. It's curled up in a ball, an adaptation against predation. When it feels comfortable, it's a normal creature. But its feet are all folded up inside with its nostrils, and it's pretty difficult for a predator to access. The tenric is enigmatic. They're closer to elephants. That means that the tenrec and the elephant share an ancestor. It means that they're monophyletic, of the same origin. It's just extraordinary. It's once again the, to see the incredible strength of evolution. It is wonderful to see convergent evolution in such a dramatic fashion and form. It's wonderful. It's, it's extraordinary. You read about these things and it's just always great to see it. So it's just extraordinary. There, well played, miss. Thank you. Twenty years ago, there were a lot of forests in Madagascar that were unknown to scientists. And the least we can do is look at archival data of things that exist today but might not exist in the future. It's sad to say in this case, but that's the reality. Lots of my colleagues say, Steve, you're too pessimistic and things like that. But it's not like that. I'm a realist and this is a very important aspect of our job.
Here, there are a number of bats that were captured yesterday, and now it's time to release them. The mission is over. The researchers will now release the last animals captured before dismantling their base camp. Then comes the return to the city and the office. I think he'll be glad to get home. He's looking at us. He's on the plant. We currently spend maybe four or five months of the year in the forest. But that's since the birth of my son, who's now seven. Before, I used to spend around eight months a year there. And now, I've cut it down to four or five so I can be closer to my family. Discovering new species and sharing his knowledge in order to push back the frontiers of science. That's the life philosophy of Steve Goodman. To this wildlife adventurer, adjusting to the pace of life in the forest is also the best way to understand the animal world. I was born in the city of Detroit, Michigan, and that really was the big city. And at the age of 13, my father bought a farm in the Michigan countryside, and that was when I started to appreciate nature. Often, after school on Friday evenings, I'd head off into the country for the weekend. I'd take a little something to eat. I'd sleep anywhere, and that was when I really opened up to understanding what was going on around me. It was an important time for my future. <laughs>